Uh, our topic is cultivating a culture of discipling. Turn to Ephesians 4, verse 11. I don't want to pretend like this is an exposition of the text. It's not. I'm springboarding from the text. This is a topical talk, okay? There are a few points, five in particular, I want to draw from it. Verse 11 and following. You see there, verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints. First thing to notice, what's the pastor's job? Equip the saints, very easy, right? Notice second, what does he equip the saints for? The work of the ministry. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for building up the body of Christ. So who's responsible for building up the body of Christ? The saints. And the leaders equip the saints to build up the body of Christ. I think that's what it's saying, right? And notice third how long church members are responsible to build up the body. Keep reading verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, your job, church members, if I'm talking to church members, isn't just to build each other up, you know, little ways. It's to build each other up to maturity to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. And it's your job, leaders, to build it, to equip them to do that, right? Just what the text is saying. Notice fourth, why pastors should equip and church members should minister to one another so that they would hold fast to the truth and not be deceived. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And then notice fifth and finally how church members build each other up by speaking biblical words to one another, by discipling one another. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In other words, every single part of the body has a job to do in building up the body. And I think this point gets picked up again by Paul. Look down at verse 25, where in the context he's talking about putting off the old ignorant self and putting on a new self. And then he says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then look at verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. All right, you guys came to a session on how to cultivate a culture of a discipling in your congregations, and Ephesians 4, verse 11 and following seems to basically say you do it by equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry of building up the body of Christ to mature manhood by speaking the truth in love, each part doing its work, giving grace as fits the occasion, right? That, that, that's what it's telling us to do. In other words, we're talking about a ministry that fundamentally belongs to every single member of your church. Somebody's trying to join your church. You say, hey, great, glad you're joining. Have a job for you. Building up the body, discipling other believers, and and we as the pastors are going to work to equip you to do that. Those who have received the gospel have the ministry of the gospel. This is Christianity 101, 
right? This is basic Christianity. Think of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, and I think if you study it in context, you see he's not just talking about himself as an apostle, he's talking about the Corinthians, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. After all, Jesus came to say, you know, Jesus came to make disciples, and then he, he ends his ministry, as you know, calling us to make disciples. So if you claim to be a disciple of Jesus, but you're not helping to make disciples of Jesus, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, but you're not helping others follow Jesus, I don't know what you mean when you say you're a follower of Jesus. I don't know what you mean when you say you're a disciple. This is what disciples do. They do the, what the one who's discipling them does. What is the one disciple? The one discipling makes disciples. So Christianity 101, basic Christianity, is making disciples. Uh, trouble, I think, often is church life and ministry in the 20th and 21st centuries has largely been professionalized. And I think pastors, we often think to ourselves, okay, we need a youth ministry in this church. How about I hire a youth pastor? Instead of thinking, instead of praying, how can I get the parents and the adults in this congregation to disciple the youth? Or they think to themselves, okay, we, we need more evangelism, right? And so maybe they hire a pastor of outreach and evangelism instead of, okay, how can I equip the saints to do the work of evangelism here? So quick kind of you know, side staffing tip, uh, brother pastors, when you're looking to staff or hire staff, a certain area of a church's life, make sure you're not replacing the ministry of the members. If you do that, you're a bad pastor. Okay? You, you staff, you hire pastors to equip, to facilitate the work of the church in their ministry together. Uh, another temptation for us to cultivate a culture of evangelism is just to rely on programs. And I don't think programs are all bad. I think programs can be useful. Nonetheless, programs at worst are kind of a shortcut to getting Christians to do the things that, frankly, in the gospel they should be doing. Let me give you a structure so you should do what, according to your heart, as a born-again believer, you should be doing. So that if you take away the structure, well, then they stop doing it. Well, well no, I, I want their born-again, regenerate hearts to know that your job is to make disciples. And so whether I'm at home or at work, in my neighborhood, just part of being a Christian is making disciples, evangelizing, discipling one-on-one, -on -one, and so forth. We want a culture of evangelism. We want a culture of discipleship. What do we mean by culture? What's, what's a culture? Well, you, you know what a culture is. It's it's sushi in, in Japan, it's cricket in Britain, it's burkas in the Middle East. It's the habits and values and practices of a society, right? And the culture of a church should be defined by this practice, this habit, this value of evangelizing and discipling. Again, it's Christianity 101, disciples, disciples. And let me say this as well. If the elders of your church aren't doing it, your church members aren't going to be doing it. Just think for a second, what is an elder's job? An elder's job, a pastor's job, is not to be a super Christian. An elder's or a pastor's job is to be an extraordinary, ordinary Christian. What an elder does is he lives in a way that's above reproach, and he's, he's able to teach. He's able to say, hey, consider my way of living, my doctrine, my practice, and, and follow me as I follow Christ. So an elder defines ordinary Christianity. So sure enough, think of the churches you know that are really evangelistic. I bet you see evangelistic pastors. Or, or think of the churches you know where there's a lot of fruitful one-on-one -on -one discipling going on. I bet you, if you look behind, you'll see disciple-making, one-on-one discipling, pastors. So uh, brothers and sisters both, if, if you're not doing this, don't assume that your congregation will do that. Three questions I want to answer. What is discipling? What does a church do to cultivate a culture of discipling? And three, what can a lead pastor in particular do? 
Let me just warn you, my talk is just a bunch of lists. Okay, so I'm, three questions, and each one kind of comes with a, with a list behind it. First, what is discipling? Well, a short definition is discipling is helping others follow Jesus. Discipling, as I'm using the term here, is helping others follow Jesus. It's not a program. It's not a podcast preacher. It's not an information transfer. It's a life and a lifestyle of nurturing and raising people towards Christ. You might just say it's friendship. Friendship in a Christ word direction. Taking all the powers of friendship and time together and talking and leveraging them in the direction of Christ. It's life on life, loving and word and deed. Think for a second, you have a, you have a brand new baby. You're a father, mother for the first time. And now you know you're responsible for, for raising this little one for 18 years and, and so on. What's the first thing you're thinking? Are you thinking, okay, I need a good program to raise this kid? Well, no, that's, that's a silly commercialized question, right? You know that your job with this, with this little infant is to raise this child in the fear and the nurture of the Lord through life on life, loving and word and deed, right? You're called to disciple that child. That's what discipling is. Let, let, let me break this down in four subpoints. Number one. So this is kind of Roman numeral one and then like a smaller one under it, all right? Number one, what is discipling? Number one, discipling works through instruction. Discipling works through instruction. Matthew 28, make disciples, teaching them everything I have commanded. Or Timothy 2.2, 2, and what you have heard from me, Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul thinking three generations. Hey, Timothy, child, commit to faithful men, grandchild, who will be able to teach others also. Great-grandchild. I mean, I have just a hard time just thinking, okay, who, who can I disciple? And Paul's like three generations on. Love that example. And I can tell you, I think there's a, there, in general, as you're thinking about Christian growth and uh, discipling, there's, there's going to be a one-on-one, one-to-one correlation between brothers and sisters who are, who are soaking in the word of God and growing in the faith, right? Those who love their Bibles and are read it are growing. Those who are disinterested in it aren't. Discipling works through instruction, and, and you're looking for people who are interested in knowing and studying and learning the Word of God. Right? Whether you're using the Bible to, to, to study with them, or you're using some other good Christian book to stu- discuss, uh, uh, discuss with them, or just general instruction, life in general, from the Word, discussing Sunday sermon, for instance, that's, that's who you want to spend time with. Right? Look for low-hanging fruit in your discipling relationships, people who are hungry and interested in God's word and spend time with those people. A number of years ago, a brother came to me, a brother in the church came to me and said, Jonathan, I just feel like um, I'm not growing in the faith at all. I've just kind of been stagnant for years. I'm like, are you reading the Bible? Well, no, not really. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Come to my, I get up, I do my quiet times at 6 a.m. Come to my house at 6 a.m. I'll open the door, come in and just do your quiet times with me. I'll read the Bible with you, and I'll just kind of open my quiet time to you so you can be in it. And for the next year and a half, this brother showed up five days a week. At 6 a.m., I unlocked the door. He came in. He sat down on the couch with me. Uh, We went through uh, Ephesians, outlined Ephesians. We went through John's Gospel. We went through uh, Jeremiah, a whole book of Jeremiah, reading... um, a commentary, the study of the Bible commentary. Reading, reading that and Jeremiah together, we went through a Piper book. Uh, it was an amazing year and a half with this brother. And uh, he went from kind of complacent, stagnated Christian to today he's an elder in the church. You know, praise the Lord. He, he just shot up during that time. 
And notice there's, there's two sides to this. On the one hand, we point one another to Scripture. On the other hand, we point one another to Scripture. What do I mean? What I mean is your disciples don't need you binding their consciences with your wisdom. So be careful when you're talking Bible and you're talking wisdom. God's wisdom, our wisdom, different things. I so appreciate the example of uh, Mark Dever in my life, who's, who's kind of discipled me for going on two decades now. And when you go to Mark Dever for personal counsel, he'll give you strong opinions sometimes, but frankly, more often than not, he's frustratingly silent. Should I marry this girl? Should I take this job? Uh, how, how much time should I spend in my quiet times? Uh, how much, what percentage should I be tithing, Mark? Oh, I'll, that's a good question, Jonathan. I'll pray for you. Can you give me something, brother? Well, he's super careful about not giving his wisdom as God's wisdom. And I think that just needs to be a part of the culture of our churches as well. Cultivating a culture of discipling means, hey, not I'm the super spiritual one, be just like me in all the ways I do things. Rather, it allows for, I think, a broad area of Christian freedom in those ways. Point to the Bible, but make sure you, you point to the Bible, okay, in these kinds of things. So number one, discipling works through instruction. Number two, discipling works through imitation, Think of Paul again, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I remember when I was a younger believer and my wife and I went over to Michael and Adrian Lawrence's house for dinner and bedtime came for their four kids and they said, hey, we, we got to run upstairs and put our kids to bed. Do you, you want to come with us? Well, that's kind of weird. Seriously? Yeah, yeah, sure. Come on up. So, you know, we went up the stairs and my wife and I kind of sat on the floor bunk, surrounded by bunk beds as Michael and Adrian read a little bit to their kids at bedtime and then prayed with them, and the kids asked some questions, and then we all adults trooped back down the stairs. What was Michael doing? Michael was discipling me, and Adrian was discipling my wife. This, this is what godly parenting looked like, maybe. There's one way to do it at bedtime, right? And imitation is a powerful thing because that's how culture works. That's how culture works spreads. And this is not just a Christian principle. This is very much a human principle. I remember when my daughters were younger watching their mother and, and hearing my daughters repeat things the way their mother said those things, right? We, we see people that we value and we imitate those people, whether they're doing good things or bad things. That's just the power of cultures. And I think you often get this in churches, particularly among uh, young men who you say you're discipling for the ministry. I don't know if you ever noticed. Uh, when, you, when you hear a guy, a, a preacher who's kind of trained up under John Piper, he sounds a little bit like Piper. You ever notice that? Or, or a guy who's been discipled by C.J. Mahaney. He's really like joyful and emphatic like C.J. You know anybody like that? Or, or guys who have spent a long time with Mark Dever, they tend to be kind of sarcastic and irreverent <laughs> in a godly way, right? I mean, we, we, we tend to imitate the ones that we love and we know love us and we, we tend to pattern ourselves after them for, for good or bad. But, that, but that's not quite what Paul is talking about here. He says, be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. So imitation extends to what we know of the character and love of Christ in Scripture. In other words, godliness is not looking like or sounding like or having the same worldly interests in or being emotionally constituted like John Piper, C.J. Mahaney, Mark Dever. Rather, it is learning to mimic their way of following Christ. The fruit of the Spirit in these men's lives, caring for the down and out in these men's lives, a dedication to the Word of God in these men's lives. If these men are your pastors, that, that's what you're following after. And so the younger brothers and sisters in your congregation following after the, 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 the Christ-likeness of the elders in the church. Consider their way of teaching and their life, the author 
that he Hebrews says. Number three, so the one instruction, number two, imitation, number three, amidst that instruction and imitation also. Third, discipling affirms differences, particularly in the context of a local church and the different gifts we've received. Paul writes, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. So the call of discipleship is the call to follow and imitate, but this is not an imitation that smothers differences. Instead, it highlights Holy Spirit assigned distinctives and calls everyone to use their distinct characteristics and gifts to the same end, building up the body. How impoverished, then, are those Christians who keep themselves at arm's length from the body of Christ, right? I want to follow, you say you want to follow Jesus, I want to follow Jesus. Well, to do that, what does Jesus look like? Well, he looks a little bit like him here, and a little bit like her there, and a little bit like this group of people here because Jesus is perfect and Jesus is resplendent in his manifold glory, right? And you know what a picture of that looks like? Well, I need the whole body of Christ. None of them do it perfectly. None of them do it broadly. We we just got each of our little niches where maybe we do a little bit. And that's the glory of discipling in the context of a local church, not just with your favorite podcast preacher, not with just going to conferences, but in in the body of Christ. Uh, In my own discipling, therefore, I work hard to spend time with a diversity of of individuals, brothers who are, one brother I spent a lot of time with, 10 years older than me, a couple of brothers 20 years younger than me, uh, guys with light skin like mine, brothers with dark skin like uh, a number of others, people from multiple nationalities and so forth, because I know I'll benefit from them, right? I deliberately set out to spend time with people. So if I'm in a, if I'm in a room, end of church on Sunday, for instance, and I usually try to have two or three meaningful conversations at the close of service before we, we head off, go to lunch or whatever. If, if, if I see a, 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 say, say, say a white guy who's 40-something like me standing here, and I see, say, an African-American brother or Hispanic-American brother here, I will often just kind of walk around this guy and try to greet these individuals. I don't have to. That's just a little practice I have of of working hard at seeing the different and, and trying to disciple and raise up differences in the body of Christ because I think that reflects heaven's glory, right? And it's as as you do that kind of intentional discipling in in terms of who you're spending time with, if you're only spending time with people who look like you, who are the leaders in your church going to eventually be five years, ten years from now? People who just look like you. Whereas if if you're taking intentional measures sometimes... In your personal decision, who am I going to spend time with Friday night? Who are we going to invite over for Sunday after church? A diversity in time, five years, ten years on, your your church leadership will begin to look a little different too, right? So, yeah, number three, it it, it affirms differences. Number four, fourth sub-point on discipling, the power of Christian discipling is forgiveness and grace. The power, the engine is forgiveness and grace. So much of what I've said so far could be applied to any field of discipleship. We could be talking about engineering. We could be talking about Islam, snowboarding, sailboating. Let me instruct you, now Now do what I do. Right? It works in all of those other fields as well. There's a sense in which so far all I've been giving you, brothers and sisters, is law. But what's unique, here's how you do it, right? What's unique about Christian discipleship is that it's powered by the Spirit and by the grace that's given to us through the gospel. It's not powered by the law. Jesus in John 13, as I have loved you, self-sacrificially, in your sin, with mercy, so you must also love one another, right? Paul in Romans 8, 
For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Right? So the law can't change us. We, we, we know that. God must do this work in our hearts through his son and his spirit. And so our primary task is to point out the work of Christ in one another's lives and to exemplify Christ's work in one another's lives through a gracious posture toward one another. So while we instruct and call to imitate, we're always doing this in the constant context of reminders of the gospel, right? Reminding the, the brother or the sister who you're spending time with that their worth is not found, their righteousness is not found in their own works, but and not in their ability to keep your commands, but in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we, so we, in, uh, simultaneously, as we're reminding them of the gospel in the context of these conversations, we're also posturing our, 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 our hugs and our, and our smiles and our embrace of these individuals as an accommodation to fallen human weakness. My love for you does not depend on your keeping these commands, which I'm gently exhorting you to keep. Now, any of you who are married, you know this. You know it's no good just to be a scold to your spouse. What melts your spouse, especially husbands to wives? What melts? It's grace. You know this, living with your wife in an understanding way, showing a, a gospel forbearance and a gospel love. That, that's what draws, right? And so as I'm spending time with younger brothers, and they come to me and they confess sin, I mean, I, I will read the law. One brother confessed uh, fornication to me once. And uh, I said, uh, call him Joe. I said, uh, and he'd, he'd been on a bad path for a while. I said, uh, Joe, you know, you know you don't have to be a Christian. You can just stop being a Christian, stop calling yourself a Christian, and then you can do all this all you want. And he was like, whoa, wasn't expecting that. Of course I went on. Because J J Joe, being a Christian means you're, you're no longer living this way. It, it means you recognize there's something better. And so you're fighting against that. And you're putting off the old and you're putting on the new. So if you're not going to do that, Joe, just, just you know, give up the game. Just stop calling yourself a Christian. I was trying to call him to live according to the gospel that he proclaimed, right? That's what I was doing. So th there certainly is a place for law. At the same time, my brother Joe knows how much I love him, even when he confesses fornication to me. I'm going to call him to account, but I'm also going to show him in every way I can grace, embrace, love, mercy, right? I'm so grateful, Joe, you confess that. Do you not see, Joe, that even your confession of that, you came to me, you confessed that, that's a work of, that's an evidence of grace in your life. Praise the Lord that even that you wanted to confess. Keep going, man. Let's, let's fan that flame. All right. Other forms of discipleship are not this way. Other forms of discipleship are meritocratic. You prove yourself, you gain approval. Whether we're talking about engineering students, sailing students, Christian discipleship, however, is paradoxical like this. There's no extra approval shown to the worthy to be had. Because from the very beginning, we possess the worthiness of the Son himself. We have his approval. And I could give you example after example of how when I've confessed a sin to a brother and he forgave me, it just melted my heart and made me want to follow him all the more. Or when I've done the same, it's, it's melted the brother and he's, he's followed me all the more. Now, if we're talking about elder qualifications, that's something different. Okay? That's another conversation. Elder qualifications, Paul lists them. You do need to be above reproach. But as we're talking about general Christian discipleship, and even somebody who you're discipling towards eldership, there is 
The power is in the gospel. The power is in grace and forgiveness. I think young men often miss this in their preaching. Their preaching is often full of imperatives and not many indicatives. Uh, And I think young men especially can do this in their discipling too. Taking the hard line all the time. And there's a place for the hard line. But there's also uh, a place to remind people of of the indicatives of the gospel. Let me just be, as as I close out this idea of what is discipling, let me me just uh, show very practically what it looks like in my own life, how it's it's structured. It's going to look different times and different seasons, especially accommodating my wife and children and their ages and And uh, one thing it's always going to look like, though, is just deliberateness. I'm looking to use my time as one lay elder in the church. My full-time work is with nine marks. I'm a a non-staff lay elder, so I have a job that's not pastoring. But then I pastor evenings and weekends, as it were, like I trust many of you. What does discipling look like in my life? It means trying to grab the little bits of time I have and use those to help others follow Jesus. It's 6.30 a.m. I'm going to call, in fact, Joe, the same Joe I was talking about. Joe is just very unwise. I'm like, hey, Joe, let's just read through Proverbs together. I'll call you in the morning for five minutes. We'll read a chapter. We'll do that for 30 days, right? Grab five minutes right there. I used to meet with Doug every other week. Now it's more like once a month. Uh, Usually we do it over lunch. He started dating a girl. I said, okay, how about you two come over and, and meet me and my wife and, and spend time with us so my, my wife can be some help there as well. I met with Joel once a week for breakfast for about seven years. Schedules have changed. It's harder now. We meet maybe once a month now. Every other Tuesday morning, I meet at Starbucks on the Hill with two other elders for accountability. We've been doing that for, for years now. That is crucial in my own discipling. I mean, I think I'm a little bit helpful to them too, but man, it helps me. Every month I do a Skype conversations with three other pastors from around the country. These are some of my oldest Christian friends. Craig and I meet in the evenings after the kids go down about once a month. My wife and I try to schedule hospitality for other families on a semi-regularly basis. Lately, it's been a little less regular with, with our kids' age and so forth. And then, of course, you have the guys who are my closest friends, and we'll hang out more casually from time, whether at the pool with our kids or seeing a movie, but there's going to be a lot of spiritually deliberate conversations. They're, they're close friends because we can have those spiritually deliberate conversations. Now, I'm kind of an extrovert. You don't have to be an extrovert like me. Whatever emotional energy you have, Mark Dever will often say, whatever, whatever emotional money you have in your wallet, spend it. If you have a dollar, spend it. hundred dollars, spend it. So I'm not trying to make you guys look like me. I'm just trying to give you practical examples of what such deliberate this night might look like. Okay, that's what discipling is. What does a church do to cultivate a culture of discipling? All those relational things I was talking about, it's my life, but it's set in the context of the church's ministry of the word. We gather on the Lord's day to be equipped to do that kind of work. Right? Okay, what does what, what the organized church look like? 11 quick points. All right? 11 quick points. Number one, center the church's weekly gathering around the gospel. Every, you're, you're not there, and I'm saying this because there's so many churches I know where it's like you show up and they're, they're trying to build culture warriors or something. And they, yeah. Okay, there's a place for that. But you're preaching to Christians and you're reminding them of the gospel and that they need the gospel and how precious the gospel is. So wherever I am in scripture, I'm I'm doing it with a view towards the gospel. Number two, preach all of scripture. It's all the word of the king. And if we're going to be citizens of the king, we need to hear all of it, right? And in that sense, you might look for different structures. I, I see a lot of churches where all they have is sort of the Sunday morning slot, the main sermon. And if the you know, the pastor's going through the book of Romans or Mark or whatever. That's kind of all the saints get all week. And in some cases, that may be all you can do, and that, that's fine. But man, I, w- I want you to look for other ways, other places in the week where you can be showing them other pieces of scripture. Something Capitol Hill Baptist did, which was wonderful, is they have these core seminars, Sunday school, but they call them core seminars, a little cooler. And uh, they're topical, 
And you don't go to a permanent Sunday school like I'm in the 30-somethings. Rather, they're kind of divided th- th- seven to 13 weeks, and they go through different tracks. So basic Christianity, Old Testament overview, New Testament overview, systematic church history, parent dating, courtship, parenting, uh, the will of God, apologetics, evangelism. You, you go through these things. And what they're doing is they're putting good biblical teaching into the backpacks of people, assuming we only have them in D.C. for three or four years before they leave, putting back good teaching in their backpacks so they can, they can go with that. And even if not everybody goes to the evangelism course seminar, it begins to disseminate in the culture of the church. And not everybody goes to the will of God seminar, but the way it's taught, the will of God is taught, and how we understand the will of God disseminates in the church, Right? Okay, so I was introduced a few moments ago uh, as being at Capitol Hill Baptist Church. I'm not. In February, about 60 of us left to plant a church just outside the Capitol. And uh, me and the other elders of our little church plant of about 65, 70 people were saying, okay, all we have, we, we elementary school, and so we're sort of stuck with, with the three hours that we, we can rent that space. And... So we are asking ourselves, oh man, we have so much other good teaching, what do we do? So we decided to use the small groups, and we took some of the core seminar material from Capitol Hill, like we want awesome evangelists. Let's take the, the Capitol Baptist Evangelism Core Seminar and feed it through our small groups. Okay, that's how we, in our church plant situation, are trying to think about exposing the saints to all of Scripture, right? Looking for different channels. Find what works in your context. Okay, number three, this will go faster. Number three, apply sermons and Bible study lessons corporately. I trust you know what it means to apply individually. Be holy, you know, careful with your eyes, whatever. Uh, Okay, what, what does be holy mean for us as a church? Well, it means we need to help one another fight sin. It means we want to be careful who we take as members. It means we want to practice church discipline. So wherever I am in the text, I want to think, through my, think, think to myself, whether I'm teaching a Sunday school or a, a sermon, what does it mean for us as a church? Apply scripture corporately. Number four, encourage church members to build their lives into one another's life and, and pray regularly about that. Encourage them in your preaching and teaching to have meaningful conversations after church. Don't just talk about football, that's fine, but also talk about the sermon. Be willing to confess embarrassing things about yourself. Uh, In our prayer service, every single week, Mark lifts that up as a prayer request, that we would have meaningful conversations in which we would have uh, be able to confess embarrassing things about ourselves. Number five, declutter your church calendar so that people have time to meet. Number six, provide tools for evangelism and discipleship. You might offer an adult Sunday school class on them or small groups devoted to these topics. You might recommend good books from the front and then provide books at discount at your church bookstore. We even have uh, these evangelism Sunday school classes where people practice doing that and so forth. Number seven, highlight who the church is by practicing church membership, fencing the table, and using a church covenant. Do the members of your congregation know that they are responsible for one another? And Paul says they are, right? 1 Corinthians 12. Is that just intuitive to the members of your church? Do you use a church covenant? Do you fence the table in a way that reminds them that they are responsible? When one part suffers, we all suffer. When one celebrates, we all celebrate. You know, once a month, my church stands up and says, the church covenant, we will walk together in love as Christ commands, caring for each other, watching over each other, and encouraging and admonishing one another as occasion requires. Well, what does that do? That reminds us of our ownership and work of affirming one another and discipling one another in the faith. Number eight, practice church discipline. One-on-one discipleship works best and makes the most sense in the context of practicing church discipline. Number nine, live near the church if you can. Geography counts. Jesus left heaven, came to earth, right? He came near. Insofar as you can, look to live near other members of your church. Look to the the gathering of the church. Number 10, establish a plurality of staff and non-staff elders. You don't just want one guy demonstrating what ordinary Christianity looks like. You want a team 
of beloved guys doing that. Number 11, finally, create many other opportunities to teach. So that core seminar structure means that there's about 80 different opportunities for young men in the church to practice teaching. The small groups are other slots for people teaching. Mark never preaches in the Sunday evening service, so that's 52 times a year some young brother in the church can practice teaching, right? That is raising up teachers. So look at your structures, look at your context, figure out how can I provide more opportunities to see young people preaching. Last question, what can the lead pastor in particular do? And I want to highlight this in particular because the central element in discipling is giving away authority putting responsibilities in people's hands even though you could do a better job of it and giving them a chance to make mistakes. That's what it means to call people to imitate. You do what I do. I think that was God's posture in the garden. Be fruitful and multiply, subdue and rule. It's what he did most supremely with the Son, all authority in heaven and on earth. It's what he does with the saints. Do you not know, saints, you will judge the world? And as such, I do think the lead pastor has a crucial role in this and sets a crucial personal example of of giving away authority. Here are 18 things. I've watched Mark Dever do, and I would commend to you. Number one, you want to limit the percentage of main slot preaching. Mark limits himself to 55 to 65 percent of the preaching a year in the Sunday morning main slot. Now, he couldn't do that at the beginning when he first took the church, but eventually he taught the church it doesn't depend on him, it depends on the word. He's not trying to create himself as this celebrity preacher. I'm sorry you want me to preach. I, these younger men, yeah, that. Yeah, they're going to bumble their way through, but but trust me, just wait and watch. You're going to find yourself excited to come to church because of the word, not because of me. So limit, senior pastor, your own main slot preaching. Number two, uh, if you have a second service, like an evening service, give other guys the opportunity to do that. Number three, as I said, give young teachers the chance to make mistakes. Let them be boring. Number four, let others steal your ideas and best phrases. Number five, be willing to lose elder votes. I remember hearing an an associate pastor saying of his senior pastor, yeah, he never loses a vote. And if he does, he'll come back in the next meeting and find a way to win the vote. And I'm just like, oh, man, he's just telling every other elder in that room, you're wasting your time. He's not passing out authority. Be willing to lose votes, brother pastors. Number six, be slow to speak and speak sparingly in elder meetings, especially if you have a big personality. Number seven, don't be the chairman. Maybe be the chairman at first if you're trying to bring reform to a church and kind of establish patterns and and the way things work. But then as soon as you can, step back and let another leader rise up and set the agenda and, and walk the elders through that. Number eight, uh, let the elder, elders lead the congregation through difficult members' meetings. Number nine, use an invitations committee for outside invitations. Let them actually decide. You're called to do other stuff. Hey, guys, should I do this? Give them authority in your life, right? Number nine, ten, be devoted to one or two things in your church. I'm here to teach and give freedom in other ways. Don't have to be on top of everything. Speaking of number 11, don't micromanage. Uh, micromanagement not only exhausts a leader, it undermines the initiative of others. Number 12, review weekly services among those who were in the service. Teach people both to give and receive godly correction and encouragement. Number 13, be willing to receive criticism yourself. If you can never receive criticism, Criticism, lead pastor, senior pastor, you're teaching everybody around you that they must conform to your preferences or be punished. And leaders do not grow in that kind of environment. They either wither or they leave. Number 14, invite your elders, your lay elders, to give feedback to the services. Number 15, pray for other churches and other denominations 
That demonstrates that you're about the gospel and not about your program. You're about the kingdom, not about your turf. That just sends a good signal. Number 16, be quick to forgive. If you are quick to forgive, you will find it easier to entrust and empower others. Fault finders are slow to give away authority. Number 17, rejoice in the victories of others and be lavish in your praise. Don't be a flatterer, but be quick to commend the, the successes of others and the victories of others. Number 18, commit for the long term. Commitment to staying in a place allows you to cultivate that culture over time. When the leader on top is characterized by giving away authority like this, it dramatically and wonderfully affects and shapes the church's culture. It makes the gospel uppermost, not his ministry. It keeps the church from being tri not tribalistic or turfy. It encourages church members to share resources because they're not out for themselves. It destroys natural hierarchies. It cultivates trust. It cultivates teachability and a willingness to receive criticism. It promotes a willingness to forgive. It encourages the church to be training-minded. It encourages them to be outward-focused. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. Happy to talk to you afterwards. If you have questions, let's pray. Lord God, we confess we're selfish. We're selfish with our time. And yet you were merciful and you initiated and brought us to salvation. You used brothers and sisters in our lives to speak the word and example the word in our lives. Help us to do the same. I pray for every church here, Lord, that the, uh, as a consequence of this talk, we would go out and work harder at making disciples and leading others. And we, do, we'd, we would do this remembering the, the very gospel we have received. In Christ's name, amen.